Welcome everyone to today's webinar titled Decimeter Positioning in an Urban Environment Through a Scalable Optical Wireless Network, based on a paper published in the Fall 2023 issue of Navigation, the Journal of the Institute of Navigation. This paper can be accessed from the Navigation Open Access website at navi.ion.org, where you can read, download, cite, and share this article and many others. Today's webinar is presented by Dr. Christian Tiberius. Dr. Tiberius is an associate professor at Delft University of Technology, Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences in the Netherlands. He received his PhD on recursive data processing for kinematic GPS surveying from Delft University of Technology. He's been involved in GNSS positioning and navigation research since 1991 with an emphasis on high precision GNSS positioning, data quality control and integrity, and recently on terrestrial radio positioning as well. Since 2017, he's acted as the project lead of the Super GPS Project in a consortium of Delft University, Amsterdam University, and Dutch National Metrology Institute, VSL. Today's webinar will be recorded and will be available on our website at ion.org and on our YouTube and other social media channels. Following the presentation, uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. You can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button in your viewer. So thank you for joining us. We'll now turn the time over to Dr. Tiberius. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Rick, for your uh, comprehensive introduction. Uh, welcome to this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm presenting from the, uh, the office uh, in Delft, in, uh, on the uh, QDelft uh, campus. Local time is uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. Colleagues uh, start moving out. Um, I've prepared uh, 28 or 29 slides for you. And uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, present this uh, ION webinar to you about our uh, terrestrial optical wireless uh, PMT system. So let's uh, get started. Rick already mentioned uh, this presentation is uh, based on uh, on the paper recently uh, published in the uh, ION navigation. I'll definitely like to uh, acknowledge my uh, co-authors. Uh, there is Gerard Janssen, Jeroen Koelemey, Erik Dieriks, Sharif Diouf and uh, Han Doen. Uh, this is actually a Dutch consortium of uh, three parties, uh, the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and uh, also National Metrology Institute, uh, VSL, next to uh, Delft University of uh, Technology. The project uh, was funded by the uh, Dutch uh, Research Council. Now, that's all about the uh, administrative details. Uh, let's get started. The aim is to uh, complement GPS or GNSS. Now, I'll uh, first like to acknowledge that uh, GPS or GNSS in general are playing a uh, significant role in today's society. In particular, the uh, United States GPS has an uh, incredible, impressive uh, track record. So no misunderstanding about that. Um, I'm a GPS enthusiast to say uh, but we know it's not perfect, also from experience. And that's actually our intention with this research, that we like to uh, to complement it, to fill the gaps, uh, the blank spots that uh, GPS or GNSS uh, leave. So complement, not compete. And actually with this project, we take uh, quite a pragmatic approach. I would say that uh, suits us as uh, Dutchmen. Uh, let's try to propose a system that is, yeah, to some extent, relatively easy to, to implement, eh? rather than uh, proposing the brilliant academic system that is so exotic that it will never make. Um, the problem, eh? let's take GPS to, uh, to town. Now, probably from, uh, from your experience, you, uh, you know that the, uh, the blue dot, uh, yeah, when you are in town uh, with uh, a lot of buildings uh, obstructing the signal, causing reflections, eh? the blue dot is not always doing well in town. And uh, saying that uh, I use every now and then is that uh, actually GPS performs worst where we need it most, in, at least in today's society. Now, definitely there's not to blame GPS for that. Uh, it was designed 50 years ago. That's also what we are celebrating this year. But in the first place for positioning uh, jet fighters in the air, uh, ships in the, uh, on the ocean and uh, tanks in, uh, in the desert. Only later, uh, civilian use at a large scale emerged. And uh, then I would say, uh, my, my saying is, is right, eh, that actually GPS performs wor worst where we need it most, most of the time and in most of the locations. And that's actually in, uh, in urban areas. 
So again, not compete with GPS in uh, in this location. Uh, also not there. GPS is perfect. Uh, also in the uh, the flat parts of the Netherlands, uh, the, the polders. Uh, but this may be a different story. Uh, this is one of the uh, the main streets uh, downtown in uh, in Rotterdam. I would say this is as close as you can get to uh, an American downtown scenario in the Netherlands. And uh, last year, uh, I took a GPS receiver, a uh, recent one, also a decent one, uh, multi-constellation, uh, targeted for uh, automotive applications. And uh, I took it in this main street, uh, drove forth and back. And uh, now actually what you'll uh, see is that uh, yeah, there's a hill, a serious detour here. I was actually driving on the left lane. Uh, the receiver thinks I'm on the right lane. I knew I was on the left lane because I, I know I had to turn around there on the roundabout. Uh, stop for the traffic light. You see the, the dots wandering around. Uh, some jump here. Uh, that's typically caused by, by reflections of these tall buildings. Uh, that's multipath. Now, I've prepared a short uh, audio demo on, on multipath. Uh, Probably this is actually not needed in the uh, the expert uh, audience that I'm talking to. Uh, it's more uh, a an, an demonstration of multipath for the uh, for the layman, but maybe at some point you can use it uh, to show it to uh, a similar ID to uh, to clients or uh, or customers. So what I've done, I've taken a uh, small audio fragment, uh, something which was uh, copyright free, free uh, U.S. Constitution, the preamble. So I'll uh, play it first in. Uh, in its straight form. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the... Now, uh, in particular, if the text is already displayed, you could probably uh, hear that and, and understand that uh, quite well. Now, what I'll do next is, uh, is to play the same fragment, but just with a single reflection added. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic Sorry, tranquility, provide for the, the one we already had. I have to play the next one. We, the people of we, the United the States, of the United in order States, to form a more perfect union, form a more perfect establish union. justice, establish justice, domestic tranquility, ensure domestic tranquility. So you can hear uh, one reflection, but still the message uh, comes across, and it's still uh, we, we can still understand that human hear, uh, human hearing can uh, can handle that. Now the last one is actually the one with multiple reflections added, and that's uh, the graph at the left where you see the, the channel impulse response. So there are I think up to seven reflections with different relative amplitudes added, different delays, and uh, let's hear what we uh, we get at that stage. Uh, just a minute, yeah. A lot of echoing, and uh, the bottom line is that uh, eh, even a uh, human being, yeah, uh, the message gets lost. There are so many reflections you don't, uh, yeah, you don't can you don't recognize the words. You can't tell what what's being uh, said. Now, that's actually also uh, the, the case with multipath. In that sense, it's similar. Uh, the multipath reflections of the electromagnetic si signals of the uh, satellite uh, start to confuse all those reflections, start to confuse the, uh, the receiver. So we have thought about that, and uh, we think we have a fundamental, very fundamental solution to multipath. Now, there's probably a small, uh, tiny flaw in the plan. Uh, you really get rid of the multipath. Uh, but you cause smaller problems, uh, people not being happy. So probably it's up to us, navigation community, electric engineers, telecom uh, engineers, to come up with a smart solution to do something about this. And that's also what we try to do in the uh, in this uh, terrestrial radio positioning system. Uh, I'll show you the uh, multipath error envelope. So that's the maximum error in this scenario. Uh, that's a scenario of a direct line of sight and uh, only one reflection, just to uh, to keep it simple. Uh, the relative path of the reflection was set to 0.6 uh, with respect to uh, one for the uh, direct line of sight. And then the uh, delay is uh, shown along the uh, horizontal axis 
and along the vertical axis, then the, uh, the maximum error. So that's the maximum error due to uh, induced by multipole. Now, there are the, uh, the yellow and the, the blue line. They represent 20 megahertz of, uh, of bandwidth. And you see that the, the maximum error ranges up to uh, four meters about. Now, if we turn uh, the bandwidth up to 160 megahertz, the red curve, it's almost a factor of 10. Then we also gain uh, or we reduce by almost a factor of 10 the maximum multipath error. Uh, up to 0 0.4, 0 0.5 uh, meter. Now, that's actually uh, pretty much a uh, fundamental uh, property in, in time frequency uh, theory. Uh, more bandwidth gives better time resolution, better resistance against uh, multipath. So we're looking for bandwidth, and preferably we uh, would like to have the bandwidth in the 1 to 10 gigahertz radio spectrum. Also, uh, because we're targeting urban areas, so the coverage, the propagation of the radio wave uh, should, yeah, at least uh, cover a lot of uh, a couple of hundred of, uh, of meters. Higher frequencies may be suited for uh, for indoor. So that's to uh, to summarize the uh, task we uh, we started with: uh, accurate positioning in build-up and urban areas. And uh, the answer is bandwidth. And what we need is a high, a high time resolution. Uh, a lot of bandwidth that's good for the ranging precision in terms of the uh, the Kramer hour lower bound that scales directly uh, with the bandwidth. Uh, and the second thing is uh, if you also want to have unbiased uh, time delay estimates ranges, then uh, we need also uh, a large bandwidth to uh, to get rid of the reflections that uh, to be able to uh, distinguish. The direct, direct line of sight signal from the, uh, the reflections. So head back to the uh, the audio demo. Uh, if the message consists of very short words or sounds, then you can still identify them uh, individually. If the words get long, uh, yeah, then it becomes all mixed up and uh, the message gets lost. So we like to uh, do things uh, to some extent still similar to uh, to GPS. So uh, the GPS starts from uh, atomic clocks, basically a system of flying atomic clocks, uh, based on timing, our system as well. And then the uh, receiver is listening to the satellite. So it's a one-way uh, travel time measurement uh, on the downlink in telecom terms. That's what we do as well. Uh, and also the receiver is typically mobile, uh, has a cheap, uh, cheap equipment, uh, so not an atomic clock. So in the end, we solve for the position coordinates of the receiver as well as for the uh, receiver clock offset. But we did change a couple of things. Uh, basically, two elements. Uh, that's the in uh, yellow the, uh, the optical fiber. So rather than uh, having an atomic clock at every transmitter. Uh, we have just a central atomic clock, or maybe just a few one uh, geographically spread for re redundancy, uh, but for the prototype, we just used one. And then uh, the optical fiber in, in orange distributes the time and frequency signal uh, across the area of, uh, of interest. And also to the uh, green squares, which are our uh, wideband radio transmitters. And these uh, transmitters, they cover, yeah, practically speaking, uh, the, the last mile to the uh, the mobile user because the mobile user you can't hook up to the uh, the optical fiber. Good. So in the uh, coming slides, I'll uh, detail on these two uh, key components: the optical fiber and the uh, the wideband uh, radio transmitter. Uh, first of all, uh, you see in the title, uh, the official title of our system is terrestrial network positioning system. It's quite a decent title. Uh, but to say the nickname is Super GPS, uh, that's probably a long time ago, uh, I can't recall, but on a Friday afternoon, a term that uh, our colleague uh, Jeroen Koulemey of the uh, Amsterdam University uh, coined. And actually, it's a completely a misnomer because it's not GPS, it's not satellites, it's terrestrial. Uh, so in that sense, Super LPS, local positioning system, would be more appropriate. Um, but still, if you explain the uh, the concept to the layman uh, with the name Super GPS, they quite quickly uh, make the uh, the right association. So in that sense, it uh, it's working. Okay, the first component, 
That's the uh, optical synchronization. Uh, optical fibers are being used for, uh, for data communication. So uh, what you see on this slide is that uh, up to 100 or maybe even more optical channels, uh, they are divided. Uh, they all use the same single uh, optical fiber here in, in red, uh, but by using different wavelength. And uh, so that's a wavelength uh, multiplexing or in our terms, it would be frequency uh, division multiplexing. Uh, you can create uh, a lot of different channels and uh, now put a lot, uh, a tremendous amount of data on that. That's an existing uh, fiber optic uh, connection. What we can do is in uh, actually the uh, sideband of this C-band, that C-band that's most uh, appropriate for uh, uh, communication over this uh, optical fiber because losses are uh, at the minimum. Uh, so in the, uh, that's the 1530 to 1565 uh, nanometer wavelength, but just a little bit to the left, propagation losses are a little bit higher. So typically they are not used. And what you can do there is uh, there are typically called management or service channels. And one of those channels, we can actually, two of them, used for uh, white rabbit time frequency synchronization. So this will be a uh, 1.25 gigabit per second uh, standard ethernet message. So it can carry data, but it's primarily used, uh, the first uh, purpose is to, uh, to synchronize a node here on the left side with a node on the right side. So typically hey, you would put an atomic clock on the left side, and then uh, by the optical signal, the atomic, uh, the uh, node here or the uh, uh, equipment on the right hand side uh, can synchronize to 0.1 nanosecond level, and sometimes even better, to the atomic clock. Now, there's one uh, point that I should, uh, should make it's a single fiber. So, optical data communication goes from left to right, that's one way traffic. And if you want to send data back from the right side to the left side, you need a second fiber, or actually that's that's uh, the way it is in practice. For this timing, we actually need a single fiber. So there's a signal going from the left to the right node, and one back over the same fiber to the left node again. So that's why you, in this scheme, see actually uh, two lambdas, TF1 and TF2. Just a little bit spaced, so that they don't interfere with each other, uh, but they can use the same fiber. And that's important because we need a round trip time. So the signal is sent from left to right and back to the left. So over the same fiber, uh, and by that round trip time, we can actually uh, determine the travel time over the fiber, and we can determine the uh, time difference between the left node and the right node. And if the left node is an atomic clock, then uh, the right node has an uh, as access to the same uh, atomic clock at the 0.1 nanosecond level. Um, also important to mention is that uh, White Rabbit, uh, that's not something we invented. Uh, I'll have two slides more on that uh, after this slide. Uh, but it's important to mention that uh, White Rabbit time frequency synchronization can be implemented or retrofitted on existing uh, fiber optic connection. So in that sense, it's cheap. And nothing is cheap, but you don't need to uh, create or install a, gla a new glass fiber all the way from uh, or across the, the entire area. You can use existing uh, telecom uh, networks for this and just at the nodes, uh, put extra equipment to allow for this uh, bi-directional uh, optical traffic for the uh, time frequency synchronization. Now, as I mentioned, uh, it came from... Uh, work at the, uh, maybe I'll first show this slide actually, uh, work at CERN in uh, Geneva, Switzerland uh, for the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, that's a large area, huh? it's a large facility. Uh, they have lots of data that need to go from A to B and the other way around. And uh, they had time critical applications, so they needed a sub nanosecond time distribution. And that's how they developed uh, White Rabbit. It's an open source, open hardware uh, network. And uh, several commercial companies are uh, providing equipment uh, for that. And actually, uh, already now, uh, you'll find that uh, 
equipment is being offered with already uh, by default or optionally a uh, white rabbit uh, interface. So now I'll go back to uh, this slide. Uh, well, this right, white rabbit, it's a network, uh, a fiber optic uh, network. It's based on standards, Ethernet, synchronous Ethernet and PTP, precision uh, time protocol, um, and allows for data transfer and synchronization. Now, typically, it starts from a master, an atomic clock. Uh, there you uh, put next to it the, uh, the grandmaster, and the grandmaster actually uh, distributes the optical signal into several switches, typically 18. That's the number with, uh, with white rabbit. So in the next layer, uh, you will have 18 switches, and each switch can then again uh, connect to 18 switches in the next layer. So I've only shown here one layer, uh, but you can have multiple layers. And then at some point, uh, the, the branches of the tree, they end, and then they end uh, with a sensor or some uh, some end user, some equipment, and in our case, uh, the, uh, the radio transmitters. Um, now, that's enough about the uh, optical synchronization. Uh, apart from uh, showing actually our prototype uh, outline, uh, VSL, that's the uh, National Dutch uh, Metrology Institute. That's around the corner here in Delft. You are looking at an uh, aerial uh, photograph of uh, the southern part of, uh, of Delft. Uh, VSL is located here and uh, actually the entire area here in, uh, on the top. That's uh, the TU Delft uh, campus. VSL it stands for uh, von Zwinden Laborat Laboratory. It was a Dutch uh, mathematician uh, in the 18th century. And actually, he was instrumental in, uh, in a committee proposing the, uh, the length of the meter and other metric units to, uh, to Napoleon. And uh, after that, that uh, became a standard. So I would say that's uh, really a proper name for a uh, metrology institute from Swinden. Um, the setup of our prototype. So the atomic clock is at uh, VSL, or actually there are four of them. Uh, I think I even have a photo of the uh, operator panel at, uh, at VSL. Uh, there are four cesium uh, an ensemble of four cesium uh, atomic clocks. Uh, the signal is uh, by the grandmaster uh, turned into an uh, optical uh, time frequency synchronization signal, goes to one of the TU Delft data centers, um, and then onto uh, the backup TU Delft data center, and uh, then through a different connection back to VSL so that we can also measure the uh, or monitor the round trip. From uh, one of the data centers, uh, branches made into the uh, the green village which is a uh, as the name says a small village on the TU Delft campus particularly suited for uh, yeah facilitating uh, all kinds of experiments just like uh, like our uh, super gps experiment at the green village and that's uh, actually uh, this box so we'll uh, have the uh, the optical fiber in uh, in orange or in yellow coming in and ideally, we would uh, split it or branch it in parallel sense to all our time nodes, to all our transmitters. Uh, you see the uh, transmitter one up to, uh, to six. Uh, but at that time, we are uh, September 2020, also during Corona time. Uh, and with the available, available uh, equipment at that time, uh, the only option was to uh, actually daisy chain them. So that's a little bit suboptimal. If you would put them in parallel, that's probably even uh, giving better performance. But still, uh, you see uh, table one from the paper uh, with a time interval counter, uh, pairs of uh, timing nodes were uh, checked and monitored. And uh, these are the differences uh, that were found. So they are all at the, uh, the sub nanosecond level as, uh, as promised in the, uh, the brochure. That concludes the uh, part on uh, the optical synchronization. So we'll now move on to uh, the second crucial component of, uh, of our system, and that's uh, wideband radio. Uh, now, ranging you can do uh, pretty much with, with any uh, modulation, uh, modulated signal. Uh, we chose for OFDM, basically because, uh, yeah, it's, it's often used eh, in telecommunication, uh, also in, in Wi-Fi-P, several IEEE standards, uh, Wi-Fi-P, Wi the uh, direct uh, short range communication for vehicles. Uh, because now, nah, on the long run, maybe uh, something like Super GPS can also be used for, uh, for automotive applications, automated and assisted driving. Um, now, nothing fancy. Uh, we took uh, 
uh, bands for the OFDM signal of 10 megahertz, uh, 64 subcarriers, and then put a QPSK uh, on each of the, uh, the subcarrier. Some further figures are that uh, we then put 16 bands together, so 16 parallel uh, OFDM signals in the end to create a total bandwidth of 160 megahertz. And the uh, Dutch Telecom Authority was uh, very kind to uh, provide us with an experimental license on uh, this frequency, the 3.96 uh, gigahertz, uh, with the recommendation, uh, please keep your antennas pointing down, your transmitting antennas. Um, then the arrangement of the, uh, the uh, radio transmitters. Uh, so the timing node is feed, uh, converting the optical signal into uh, two electrical signals, one PPS pulse per second, and, and uh, 10 megahertz uh, frequency reference. And then the transmitter, uh, we used uh, national instruments at this uh, USRPs, X310 for that. Uh, maximum bandwidth was 160, uh, so that also explains why we, uh, we used uh, 160. It's just uh, the maximum the thing can handle. Um, transmission is made to the receiver, but actually we have six transmitters, and our choice, at least with the prototype, was to use time division, so uh, each transmitter has uh, got assigned a small time slot to do it, uh, to transmit its burst, and then the next one, and then the next one, and so on. Uh, that's actually, in, uh, for the receiver, it, it's slightly easier to uh, to handle. Um, but uh, in, in, in later uh, implementations, uh, you can also do that in, uh, in overlap, in, in, in parallel. Uh, then you see uh, in this one millisecond, uh, we have uh, a total of uh, 160 microseconds of transmissions, and then the rest is uh, pretty empty. And that's simply uh, to allow the uh, yeah the receiver USRP to offload all the data to the uh, to the host PC because with 160 megahertz of uh, of bandwidth you quite quickly uh, accumulate a lot of data. Now the last uh, diagram shows the uh, the outline of the transmission per base station, uh, and that's uh, using training symbols, two training symbols, and then a shortened moose symbol, and particularly training symbols uh, that's uh, data that's known in advance to the uh, to the receiver that's being used for uh, the time delay uh, estimation. Good. Um, time delay estimation, that's crucial uh, that's, uh, to say, how do we get our, uh, our pseudo ranges? Um, now, uh, the standard is uh, packet and frame synchronization and then turn the signal into the, uh, the frequency domain in order to uh, recover the data bits. Uh, in our case, uh, by the training symbols or the pilot symbol or whatever you call it, the data is known a priori to the receiver, and that allows the receiver to uh, determine or estimate the, uh, the channel frequency response, uh, typically indicated by the, uh, the capital H. And then we build our observation model uh, for the range estimation. We build it in the, uh, the frequency domain. So over all the subcarriers uh, that uh, we stack in a, in a vector, and then on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see uh, unknown parameters. That's the tau, and that's the alpha. So that's the time delay, and that's the attenuation or amplitude. Uh, I should say that in our model, uh, we start from a channel impulse response built of Dirac delta pulses. So uh, the signal can be delayed. Uh, we can receive copies, reflections. Uh, that signal can be delayed and attenuated, but not distorted. Uh, and that, in our case, uh, performed uh, well. And actually, uh, thanks to the large bandwidth uh, in the prototype, we could just use uh, a single arm correlator to say, or uh, in the model, allow for only uh, the direct line of sight signal. And the uh, uh, time delay estimation, we did not need to uh, account explicitly for all the uh, or for the uh, for the reflections. Good, and then you see here the DFP, that's actually the, uh, the subcarrier uh, frequency relative to the central frequency FC of the, uh, the entire signal. Uh, one last comment on the, uh, the receiver implementation is that uh, going back to the previous slide, uh, we uh, receive such a burst for each uh, transmitter. We run the receiver, the time delay estimation, that gives us the two ranges in GPS terminology, and that's it. And then the next uh, one millisecond, 
uh, we start completely anew. So uh, in that sense, the receiver, also the, the later results that you will see, is uh, it's, it's snapshot positioning or it's an open loop receiver. There's no signal tracking uh, being done. Good. Uh, I was already uh, announcing on uh, a prototype. Uh, we actually deployed our prototype uh, at the Green Village, a uh, kind of experimental site here on the uh, TU Delft campus. Um, with lots of different applications. Uh, it's primarily being used for uh, for energy transition and uh, climate adaptation. Uh, but it's it's a small village, you say. There are a couple of uh, brick wall houses, so that's good because that will cause uh, reflections of our signal. Uh, you see in lamppost in the uh, red ellipsis uh, two of the uh, transmitter antennas. Uh, and then the uh, receiver antenna is here in the uh, yellow ellipse uh, in this case, fixed to a trolley so that we can also, uh, be it slowly, move the uh, the receiver. So it's a mobile receiver. And later on, there's also a car in the back. Uh, the uh, receiver was uh, put on top of the car and then driving forward and back in this, uh, this road. Also, what you see is optical uh, lens surveying equipment. And you see two of them and also two prisms on the, uh, the cart or the trolley. And that's actually to establish the uh, the ground crew. So these are robotized total stations. So they are able to, even if the trolley is moving, to track the uh, the, the prism. And that will provide us with a uh, good ground truth so that we can actually establish the uh, the performance, assess the performance of the, uh, the super GPS receiver. I have one slide on uh, as a check on the, uh, the ground truth. Uh, there is a small redundancy, a redundancy of one in the uh, setup of the, uh, the ground crew. Uh, there are two prisms on the, uh, the trolley. And actually, we also know how we can actually uh, accurately measure the, the fixed distance between these prisms. We can check that. And uh, the histogram at left shows the, uh, the result of this, uh, this check. And uh, the, the root mean square uh, is then at the uh, 1.8 centimeter level. So that's uh, good enough for assessing the, uh, the super GPS system. And there we are targeting 10 centimeter accuracy. So this is almost one order of magnitude better. Through uh, uh, land surveyors uh, in the audience may be a bit disappointed. Uh, these are pretty much decent total stations. And then you only get 1.8 centimeters. Uh, you would expect uh, maybe even millimeter level. Uh, but we should take into account that uh, uh, these total stations, they have an update rate of 5 to 10 hertz. For the position the trolley is moving and they yeah, and the total states are not synchronized so uh, in the end we have to interpolate the uh, directory of the trolley and that actually is causing the, the biggest effect here on the uh, 1.8 centimeter uh, error that we find yeah. actually the measurement precision of these devices is much better but it's just the uh, interpolation of the, uh, the moving trolley now for you uh, information uh, a few photographs of the, uh, the setup uh, this is uh, one of the uh, transmitter antennas in the lamppost uh, another one fixed to a uh, rooftop corner uh, of the house uh, down there there's a box and then if you look in the box uh, and there's the timing node uh, the, the yellow glass fibers coming in and then the two uh, blue lines are going out and this is then the uh, usrp in the box and so you see the usrp is being fed by two uh, blue cables one is the one pulse per second and the other one is the, uh, the 10 megahertz and then in the end uh, a black coax scale is going out to uh, to the transmitter antenna good uh then we are ready to uh, show some uh, actual results uh, i should also mention that uh, the day before the experiment uh actually we were in the uh, green village for a full week the uh, the site manager was so kind to put even a uh, metal uh, container next directly next to the road so that uh, will give uh, even extra multipath. Um, the base stations were synchronized to the uh, VSL uh, Dutch national time scale. That was the white rabbit, uh, the optical fiber, and these are the specs of the uh, the radio signal. And we run the uh, uh, receiver at the one hundred uh, one thousand hertz rate. Uh, so. Uh, the transmitters are sending, repeating yeah, the transmissions every one uh, millisecond. So, and then finally, uh, some results along the uh, horizontal axis. You see the, uh, the measurement time. Uh, the car drives forth and back slowly, uh, and that will typically take two to three minutes. And uh, along the vertical axis, you see the 
actual position error uh, reference to the uh, to the ground truth. And then uh, if we uh, compute some statistics of them, uh, at the bottom you'll see the uh, root mean square, eight centimeters and uh, ten centimeters in this run, and it was pretty much uh, repeatable over uh, several experiments uh, later the same day and even across uh, the days in the week. The positioning, there's still one uh, comment to make about positioning. It's actually a two-dimensional positioning model. And probably you can already guess why, huh? because the transmitters, they are all pretty much at the same height, three and a half to four meters above the surface. Uh, the transmitter, uh, the receiver antenna is at 1.4 to 2 meters, uh, 1.4 to 2, uh, 2 meters above the, uh, the road surface. So it's a pretty flat geometry. And uh, that actually, allow, in theory, you can do three-dimensional positioning with this, uh, but uh, in GPS terms, the VDOP is very poor. So uh, if you just have a 10 centimeter uh, ranging accuracy, that will uh, amplify uh, by the, the vertical uh, dilution of position, will amplify to uh, maybe up to half a meter or even more. So that is really spoiling then the uh, positioning results. So that is why we uh, decided to, uh, to go for 2D positioning. Uh, but 3D positioning is, is possible as well. Uh, six transmitters, uh, time delay estimates. So here are our six uh, pseudo ranges. Uh, we solve for the two horizontal uh, position coordinates of the receiver and for the uh, receiver clock offset. Um, now to make the story, uh, uh, I hope for you uh, a bit more convincing, uh, we have already seen the uh, results with the 160 megahertz of bandwidth. Now let's uh, turn it down the same run, eh, but uh, put the uh, receive signal through an, uh, a filter and just leave 20 megahertz of bandwidth. Uh, you see, you also see a lot of spikes there. Uh, scale, mind the scale is now a factor of 10 larger, so it's ranging up to six meters. Here on the right, it's just up to uh, 0 0.6 meters. Uh, now that's again effect of uh, of ten. So uh, the message here is, yeah, bandwidth is working. Uh, P and T. So we are also interested in, uh, in time. Uh, the system can do wireless time transfer. On one of the runs, actually, uh, we made sure we had uh, a pretty long uh, glass fiber. So we connected it to a time node and then uh, connected that time node to uh, to the receiver, so that the receiver was also synchronized to the uh, atomic clock ensemble of, uh, of VSL. Uh, but in the processing, we acted like we didn't know that. And then we were estimating the, uh, the uh, clock offset. So ideally, we would get a uh, zero uh, value for the, uh, the clock uh, offset. That was not the case. It is pretty constant. So that's good. Huh? If we take a look on the, uh, the histogram here at right, you'll see that uh, in terms of uh, distance, uh, the empirical standard deviation is just four centimeters. So that's uh, very small. And it's uh, really at the uh, sub nanosecond level. That's very good. But you see a really huge value here in the, uh, the vertical uh, axis, uh, even up to five kilometers. Now, that's nothing else than uh, the hardware delay and uh, the joint hardware delay of the uh, transmitter front end and the uh, receiver front end. And that also underlines uh, that you uh, have to be uh, very good at calibrating uh, equipment before you can use it for, uh, for time transfer. So to uh, summarize, uh, we hope to uh, have proposed an, uh, a smart scientific solution to a problem in, uh, in society. Uh, had two key components of this terrestrial network positioning system are uh, the optical fiber, used for uh, time frequency uh, synchronization. And the good thing is that it can be retrofitted on existing glass fiber connections that are already in use for uh, data communication eh, at relatively low cost. Uh, you only need to access the nodes, not the fiber that's already uh, in the ground. Then the uh, wideband radio transmitter. Uh, now we show that uh, 20 megahertz versus 160 megahertz. That was really making a difference in terms of uh, resistance against multipath. Uh, so that's working, but there is still an, might be an issue that in this range, uh, this ideal range from one to 10 gigahertz, uh, 
we can go to the, uh, the telecom agency, knock on the door and say, hey, listen to us, we have a nice plan and we would like to have 200 or maybe even better 400 or 500 megahertz of bandwidth. Yeah, uh, we won't get it. Uh, the spectrum is already fully occupied. And actually, during the project, we came to the uh, idea of a virtual wideband radio. For ranging for telecommunications, different. If you want to transmit a lot of data, you really need a wide bandwidth. But for uh, ranging and positioning, PNT, it's different. Huh? We use known signals, uh, training symbols, known to the receiver in advance. And then we may not need the full bandwidth, but just a few parts of it, a few, few fragments of it. So suppose there is a band of uh, one gigahertz available and we just have 10 megahertz at the start, then uh, 10 megahertz at uh, one quarter, 10 megahertz at half of it and so on. And then also one band of 10 megahertz at the end. Yeah, so in total, uh, 30, 40, 50 megahertz of bandwidth over this very wide band. Uh, now, first simulations and also a few experiments uh, we carried out very preliminary uh, show that uh, even with such a signal, you achieve actually uh, performance very, very close to using the entire bandwidth. So in some sense, it sounds a bit uh, magic, I would say. Uh, if you use only a few percent of the bandwidth for ranging, uh, the performance degradation is only a few percent. Uh, so you go from 100% maybe only down to 95. That's very attractive because then we think we can also... Uh, yeah, that, that opens up the, the possibility of implementation practice, for instance, in 5G. And the frequency bands match quite well. Uh, operators typically have different bands, several bands in, in parallel. Uh, and then you could uh, uh, plug in uh, a signal, an OFDM signal, for, uh, for ranging into uh, those bands. Good. Again, I would like to uh, thank all the... Uh, Co-authors, uh, I think we really had a very uh, competent and uh, fruitful collaboration. Jeroen Koulemey, Gerard Jans, Erik Dieriks, Handoen and uh, Sharif Youth. Uh, and I should also acknowledge uh, colleagues from the uh, QDelft Delft ICT department, uh, also from SURF, that's the uh, national, in, uh, national uh, organization to uh, support uh, academics in the Netherlands on, on ICT, also the uh, Agentschap Telecom, that's the uh, uh, Dutch uh, Telecom Authority, uh, the Green Village, the experimental site, and uh, also would like to uh, thank the uh, Navigation Editor-in-Chief, Associate Editor, editor and the uh, four reviewers for uh, their time and uh, useful feedback in the uh, paper uh, review process. Uh, Rick already mentioned, uh, you can find this in the uh, IOM navigation, uh, the paper with, uh, I would say, quite a lot of the uh, technical details. And uh, we also have a website. It's not really very fancy, uh, but you can find the information and, uh, and also uh, other papers and uh, useful links on the, on the project. And with that, uh, I would like to uh, turn it back to, uh, to Rick. Great. Yeah, thank you, Christian. This has been a great presentation. Uh, we'll now answer audience questions. You can submit your questions using the Q&A button in your viewer. Uh, Christian, we'll just begin with, uh, with a question. This is uh, interesting technology, but what would be the next step to implement this in the real world? Or what's the outlook for moving this from the academic realm to practical use? Um, yeah, actually, uh, during the... Uh... The research uh, we were already keeping in mind uh, it should have potential for for implementation uh, so we think using the existing fiber for uh, for the synchronization that's a smart move uh, typically heavy are targeting uh, urban areas in urban areas uh, there are base stations there is uh, glass fiber in the uh, in the subsurface uh, the system can be retrofitted there and in urban areas, uh, we also have a good density of, uh, of mobile telecommunications uh, base stations uh, at, in the distance uh, in real urban areas of uh, maybe just a few hundred meters. And yeah, that's actually, uh, that actually suits us very well. So uh, we believe, but okay, yeah, that's not up to, uh, to a university, but we believe that there is, uh, is good potential in uh, natural implementation in uh, practice without, uh, yeah, introducing a completely new system that uh, really needs uh, a lot of new additional uh, infrastructure. 
But that's okay. the, uh, the outlook we, uh, we have in mind. That's great. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, well, we have a few you. questions here waiting from, from audience members. Um, here's, uh, let me kind of just ask some of these questions together. Um, how is calibration uh, between nodes achieved and how is the VSL Grandmaster referenced? Um, let, let's start with the, the last one. The, the, the Grandmaster at VSL is uh, directly coupled to uh, the atomic clock ensemble at VSL. So uh, VSL is from, uh, responsible for the uh, Dutch national time scale also plays an uh, important role in uh, the international community in providing the, the atomic clock uh, around the world. Uh, so the, and the Grandmaster, the, the, the White Rabbit Grandmaster is also physically directly next to this uh, clock ensemble. So in, in that sense, uh, we have uh, access directly to, uh, to the Dutch national time scale. And actually I forgot the, the, the first question. Uh, how is the calibration between nodes achieved? Yeah, uh, that's definitely important. Uh, that, these are pieces of electronic equipment, uh, optical equipment. So signals have to travel from A to B. Uh, prior to installing the, uh, the timing nodes, uh, they were calibrated. Uh, and uh, you may think, okay, uh, they are identical pieces. Uh, but still, uh, uh, calibration is, is man definitely mandatory to uh, to get to the uh, 0.1 nanosecond level in uh, in time synchronization, and also illustrated by uh, in, in radio front end, it's uh, even way worse. Uh, hey, you have seen the uh, the receiver, the estimated receiver clock offset being at the uh, the five kilometer uh, range. So uh, in, uh, the calibration is really uh, important there. Yeah. It's, uh, Good question, good point, yeah. Okay, next question uh, is, any thoughts as to whether RTK processing of your signal is possible for even better precision? Um, yeah, that's an interesting thought, uh, RTK style. Um, yes, uh, and actually uh, the, uh, the PhD student in, in involved in the project, Han Doon, uh, has looked into this, has tried this, um to had the system from the start was uh, really uh meant as a true range uh system not as a carrier phase system uh, but okay the the OFDM signal uh is being transmitted at a certain uh, carrier the 3.96 uh, gigahertz and uh it turned out to uh it, it's possible to extract uh, carrier phase measurements uh through let's say we had to yeah, to do a couple of extra tricks uh, to make that work. Uh, so one option would be uh, to put in the area of interest a base station, similar as we, we do with uh, the GPS RTK. Uh, the other option was that actually uh, yeah, we, we, we didn't have an extra receiver, so we could not test this. Uh, but Handun uh, actually solved this by uh, first putting the receiver on a known location, then actually taking the taking in the carrier phase measurements, uh, accounting also for the initial phase offsets and, and hardware delays, and uh, once yeah, that's actually the calibration stage, and then moving on uh, to actual data collection, and then uh, it's actually then a differential setup in time yeah, because you have this uh, receiver at a known location first, that's your reference station, and then you take the same receiver and you start moving, and then it becomes your rover receiver. Uh, now, given that the uh, the setup that we created uh, was not meant for car carrier phase measurements, uh, in the end, he managed to uh, show an accuracy of the two to three centimeter level, which I think is, is excellent given uh, that the, the system was uh, not uh, intentionally meant for uh, for carrier phase. So the principle, uh, the, the, the potential is there. Uh, Handun made initial investigations, uh, but we plan also ourselves to uh, to look further into this, yeah, to uh, access the carrier phase and to make also possible, uh, just like the GPS, uh, maybe even centimeter or millimeter uh, positioning accuracy. Yeah, it's, uh, that's a good point, interesting thought. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Uh, another question here says, have you computed the height accuracy in your setup? What would be the impact of place, placing transmitters um, uh, on the accuracy of height? Um, yeah, the height issue is, uh, that, that's a good comment. Um, let's put it this way, uh, just like GPS, uh, our system is about measuring ranges, distances. So uh, in principle, uh, it can do 1D, 2D, 3D, uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, it's as long as you, you measure the, uh, the distances. For the prototype, it was simply because all the transmitters are pretty much in the same uh, at the same height, so it's it's a very flat geometry. Also, the receiver is quite close to that. Uh, we tried it, uh, and then we saw that uh, now in terms of VDOP, the VDOP is probably uh, around uh, five or six even, and then the uh, the variation, the standard deviation, for instance, in the, in the height. So we can do it. We did it. Um, Arrived, had showed up at the uh, yeah, half a meter, maybe up to a meter level. In our uh, opinion, that's then due to uh, the geometry, not due to the measurement precision. Uh, if you would, would like to overcome this, uh, then you would have to put your uh, transmitter antennas uh, way up higher, and so create diversity in uh, in height. Uh, but actually, uh, the Green Village, it's a village, uh, so they. We didn't have a uh, tall building of, uh, of 20 or 30 or 40 meters. So, uh, yeah, simply we did not, we did not have that uh, opportunity uh, for this prototype. But I think it can be definitely uh, remedied by uh, putting transmitters at, uh, at higher locations. And then I think in terms of uh, tens of meters. And then you get a good, uh, good geometry, also in the vertical sense, for, uh, for positioning. Okay, great. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, is there an intuitive explanation for why virtual wideband gives almost the same performance compared to using the full band? Intuitive. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting thought. Uh, actually, I should admit, not, not, not really, or I haven't found it yet. Uh, I, I think about it myself, it, it, it's, yeah, it, it's... it's it's also, it sounds still a bit like like magic. It, it's uh, you only use a few parts of it, and uh, you get it to a performance very close to as if you would need if if you would uh, use the uh, the entire band. Um, but I think that the, the let's say the, the switch you have to make in your mind is that uh, for telecommunication to get all these data, all the the, the zero and one bits from one side to the other side, uh, you need the bandwidth because it's and the, the information is uh, not known to the receiver in advance. Otherwise, there's no point in, in, in communication. If, if, uh, if you already know the, the, the content of the email message, you don't need to transmit it. So it's, it's unknown data. And that's the point. Uh, in, in, for PMT, uh, we typically use yeah, a template or, or a training symbol or a pilot so that the receiver knows in advance the signal that's coming. And yeah, for timing it, for seeing uh, just the delay, we are just interested in delay, even not in the content, uh, for just the delay, yeah, that's only one aspect of the, uh, the signal. And yeah, in that sense, you can argue, okay, I don't need the entire band to, uh, to listen to, uh, only a few fragments, that should be enough to uh, get a few bits of the signal, but still enough to... Uh, to determine the or to estimate the, uh, the travel time, to the time delay for pseudo ranging. But yeah, that's sufficient as an intuitive uh, explanation. That that's I leave it that uh, I leave that up to you. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Another question here uh, is: How is time synchronization achieved among the transmitters? Uh, time synchronization among the transmitters is achieved by the uh, optical fiber, uh, which I showed in uh, in yellow. Now we can uh, oh, just a minute, maybe move back to the diagram. Yeah, okay, here we are. So there's one central atomic clock next to it, the grandmaster that actually converts the. Uh, atomic clock signal into an optical signal, and then uh, the transmitters 
are somewhere at a location where they have access to uh, the glass fiber. And in our opinion, uh, one promising implementation is uh, base station because the base station and a lot of base stations for telecommunication are already on, on the glass fiber. So the glass fiber is there and you would only need to retrofit equipment. And you see here this in, in our uh, prototype, only a single atomic clock or an ensemble, but physically uh, it's, it's in one building and uh, all the transmitters are then uh, connected to the optical fiber. And so if I go back to the... Uh, just a minute, we go back to the setup of the uh, Green Village, the optical synchronization. It's actually this uh, this diagram. So we have the, the Grandmaster GM at uh, the uh, Dutch National uh, uh, Metrology Institute. From there on, the optical fiber goes to the data center of TU Delft, then on to the Green Village, the server room, and from there on in a daisy chain, that's the optimal in the daisy chain to all the timing nodes and each transmitter has a timing node. I hope that uh, actually this uh, this diagram uh, shows that uh, how we actually uh, do the, uh, the synchronization of the uh, the transmitters. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, was there any specific strategy employed to counter near far effects? Near far, uh, that's definitely an issue um, in the prototype actually uh, I should say that I'm not uh, not fully into this uh, I knew that at some point uh, or actually we started the uh, the test with uh, the receiver uh, to maximum gain in, in the front end uh, and that led to uh, oversaturation. So the uh, in the beginning, uh, to make uh, to say to make a bold statement, the receiver was not working. Uh, it was oversaturated, and then uh, putting it at uh, I think ten dB lower than what actually the, the manufacturer uh, recommended, uh, it started working, and then it actually it was uh, was fine. The signals were then received without uh, any uh, yeah any notable noticeable uh, distortion. But definitely, it can be uh, can be an issue. And also, depends, of course, on the uh, the type of modulation. Okay, interesting. Uh... Any further questions? Sorry, Christian, we're, we're back now. I think we went offline momentarily. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, sound is back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let's see, I think we have time for just one more question. This says, to synchronize two base stations, how important is it to know the length of the optic fiber connecting them? Uh, yeah, uh, again, excellent question. Uh, the length of the cable uh, should be in with the calibration. So uh, what we actually did is... Uh, simply order a whole bunch of uh, 50 meter, right? the, the Green Village is a relatively small scale, bunch of 50 meter uh, optical fibers, and then uh, whatever, always use the 50 meters. Even if uh, two uh, transmitters will be only five meters apart uh, to have the same uh, optical uh, path length. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a good point. So thank you, Christian, for your time and preparation. And we remind our viewers that a recording of the webinar will be posted to our website and social media channels within the next day or two. Uh, thanks again, and, and we look forward to having you all join us for a future IOM webinar.